headlines. Officials from the two Koreas discuss a possible trip to Pyongyang by South Korea's former first lady. Neither side is rejecting the idea, but details still need some hashing out. President Obama announces an executive order for his immigration plan. Republicans are already opposing his move, with some calling it illegal. Korea's finance minister promises structural reforms next year to boost economic momentum. Experts say much of the emphasis should be on the labor market. Hello and welcome to Arirang News. Coming to you live from Seoul, I'm Hwang Sang-hee, filling in for Kang Cheri. Officials from the two Koreas held talks on a possible trip to Pyongyang by a former South Korean first lady. But will this be enough to fuel momentum in inter-Korean ties? Our Connie Kim explains. Representatives from the two Koreas agreed on some of the details of former First Lady Lee hee hos trip to Pyongyang during talks at the inter-Korean border town of Kaesong on Friday, namely that she will travel there by car. But other issues remain unresolved. We have decided that further discussions are needed on when the former First Lady will travel to the north and who will accompany her, because Madame Lee is older. We need to consult with her and her doctors and go over the details of today's talks. The North reportedly said it would allow the former First Lady to visit children's centers as she requested and provide kids there with hand-knitted hats and clothes. Lee made her request for a humanitarian visit to the North last month during a meeting with President Park Geun-hye. But there are concerns Pyongyang may use her trip for political purposes as it comes ahead of the third anniversary in December of former North Korean leader Kim Jong-il's death. Lee Hee-ho visited Pyongyang three years ago to attend Kim Jong-il's funeral and met with current North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Experts say the former First Lady's trip is unlikely to have any meaningful impact on improving inter-Korean ties. It's not likely to change anything unless Madam E delivers a letter from President Park Geun-hye. Representatives from the two sides are set to reach out next week to arrange dates for a second round of talks on the former First Lady's trip. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Russia's foreign ministry says President Vladimir Putin is willing and ready to hold a one-on-one -on -one with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. And that's not all. It says Pyongyang is also willing to return to the six-party nuclear talks. Kwon Soa has this report. As soon as Kim Jong-un's special envoy Choi ryong hees plans to visit Russia were announced, speculation lit up about a potential summit between the leaders of North Korea and Russia. On Thursday, Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said that Russian President Vladimir Putin is ready for one-on-one -on -one talks with the North Korean leader. Speaking to reporters after his closed-door discussions with Choi, Lavrov also said North Korea had expressed a willingness to return to the long-stalled international talks on its denuclearization, calling it a, quote, very significant political progress. Pyongyang is ready to restart the six-way nuclear talks without preconditions on the basis of a joint statement issued in 2005. We fully support this decision and will also be working with all concerned parties, including the United States, Japan and South Korea, to seek common trust for the resumption of the negotiations. The six-party talks have not been held for almost six years. North Korea withdrew from the negotiating table in late 2008 after restarting its nuclear enrichment program. Thursday's talks also focused on the two countries' economic partnership. The officials discussed Russian companies' participation in the inter-Korean Kaesong industrial complex and a joint project that would modernize North Korea's railway system. Lavrov says North Korea is ready to open lines of communication with South Korea on trilateral projects if everything goes smoothly. That would include a project to transport Russian gas to South Korea through North Korea. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. In response to North Korea's latest threat to carry out another nuclear test, Washington says Pyongyang will not achieve anything through threats and provocations. At a press briefing Thursday, Pentagon spokesperson Rear Admiral John Kirby said North Korea's belligerence will undermine international efforts for peace and stability on the Korean peninsula and further isolate the regime. 
On Tuesday, a UN Human Rights Committee adopted a resolution pushing for the North Korean leadership to be brought to The Hague for crimes against humanity. And that was followed by North Korea's threat to strengthen its war deterrent. President Park Geun-hye says she was impressed by a joint statement calling for an improvement of human rights in North Korea adopted by the International Democrat Union, which is a conservative alliance of political parties. At a luncheon with the union members, the president talked about the rights abuses and famine prevalent in the North, while the regime continues on a path of international isolation with its nuclear arms development. She then asked the IDU to continuously support international efforts to peacefully reunite the two Koreas. Korea's finance minister has pledged to push forward with structural reforms next year to achieve a full-fledged recovery. An economist at the Asian Development Bank says much of the emphasis should be geared toward the labor market. Hwang Ji-hae has more. Structural reform is the key to a solid recovery momentum. That's what Korean Finance Minister Choi Kyung-hwan said on Friday during a meeting with the heads of major economic research institutes. While promising to focus on such reforms next year, Che added that Korea's recovery momentum remains weak, despite the government's aggressive set of stimulus measures. Che said Korea should take note from Japan, which has seen its economy fall into another slump due to a lack of structural reforms. An economist at the Asian Development Bank says any reforms should spread the benefits of growth among the people. Bye. Focusing too much on the supply side of the economy, we have not been able to pay enough attention, adequate attention that the Korean uh, public deserved in the demand side. So the, a lot of these uh, uh, structural reforms have to be empowering the uh, people who have, been, who have not been involved properly in the growth process. Park added that more of an emphasis should be placed on reforming the country's labor market. Our labor force participation is very low, especially the female labor force participation is, uh, you know, it's really the one of the big constraints to unlocking the uh, growth potential for Korea. Experts also say that structural reforms should include reducing the level of debt, especially among public institutions, and that deregulation measures are crucial for building up confidence in the business sector. Reflecting such calls, the Korean government is expected to draw up its economy management plan for 2015 next month, which will also include new growth outlooks. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Korea has apparently been investing a lot in research and development. The science ministry says the amount spent on R&D compared to GDP tops the world rankings. And this isn't the first time. Our Song ji has the details. Korea's reputation as one of the world's leading ICT powerhouses didn't just fall into its lap. A survey conducted by the science ministry shows Korea allocated a higher proportion of its GDP to R&D than any other country in the world for the second consecutive year. In terms of amount, Korea placed six at 54 billion U.S. dollars in 2012 after the U.S., Japan, China, Germany and France. But compared to proportion of GDP, Korea was the only country to invest more than 4 percent of its GDP on research and development in 2013. Roughly 76 percent of the investment came from the private sector, with foreign investors accounting for a mere 0.3 percent. Despite the heavy spending, researchers say more needs to be done to ensure the fruits of their labor are put to practical use. Developing new technologies is not enough. They must be commercialized, and they must open up business opportunities that attract investors. In a similar report last week, the OECD pointed out that Korea's strength in R&D lies in its strong ICT infrastructure, but that Seoul needs to boost international cooperation and joint research. 
To cater to such needs, the government announced plans to attract R&D centers of multinational companies by offering them more benefits when they established regional R&D headquarters in the country. Song Ji-sun, Arirang News. The amount of cars coming in from Europe has outpaced the number of Korean cars going overseas for the first time ever. Sales of German brands in particular have gone through the roof. Our Shin Samin looks into some of the reasons. A few years ago, European automakers called Korea an impossible market to crack. But this year, European exports to Korea are on a path to exceed Korean exports to Europe. The nation's customs data shows the value of car imports from European countries was up 60 percent to over four and a half billion U.S. dollars in the first nine months of the year, whereas Korea's car exports stood around 4.4 billion. Local sales of European cars, particularly German brands, have been on the rise. They have become so popular that some auto retailers have had to put customers on a waiting list for months. So why this shift in consumers' taste? Better gas mileage bought me. The comfort of the ride is much higher, not to mention its widely known brand power. And the Korea-EU free trade agreement that went into effect in 2011 lowered price tax, attracting more drivers to European brands. This year alone, foreign car sales in the country rose at a pace 10 times faster than Hyundai's. And the weakening Japanese currency has been undermining Korean makers' competitiveness. The performance of Korean automakers in the European market is falling, and this trend is likely to continue. Even Hyundai and Kia Motors, which have manufacturing plants located in Europe for a better supply to the local market, are losing ground because of lowered competitiveness due to the weak yen. But as the global auto industry is moving towards green cars, the analyst added Korean makers should improve fuel efficiency and move on to new technology quickly if they don't want to fall too far behind the competition. Shin Samin, Arirang News. As widely expected, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe dissolved the lower house of parliament on Friday and called for a snap election in mid-December. The moves was sparked by dismal third-quarter economic figures that suggest Japan has slipped into a recession. Prime Minister Abe hopes the snap election will give him a fresh mandate to push through reforms, including a delay of a tax hike to 10 percent that was scheduled for October of next year. He is expected to use the campaign period to explain his government's growth strategy, although an, uh, although an Asahi Shimbun survey shows that around 62 percent of the Japanese people don't understand Abe's decision to dissolve parliament. Now, if you're a fan of video games or online games, you might want to drop by Busan this weekend. The nation's largest gaming exhibition is taking place there. Kim ji files this report from Busan. More than 600 companies from 35 countries are taking part in this year's G-Star Global Game Exhibition in Busan, one of the world's leading gaming companies at the event is Oculus. It has created Oculus Rift, a virtual reality system that enables users to control movements by turning their heads and moving their hands. Um, last few decades, people have been experiencing their content with a 2D flat panel TVs. With a movie named Avatar, people had been watching the movie with a stereoscopic 3D. However, that wasn't enough. People weren't able to feel immersed into the real world. Oculus believes virtual reality will evolve and forever change the way people play games, swap content, and communicate with each other. So in the near future, when this virtual reality becomes really popular, we believe that people will be able to interact, people from overseas, in virtual world, and be able to see each other and be able to interact with each other. So you'll be more like virtual reality Skype. The four-day event is also a chance for businesses to expand their opportunities globally. U.S.-based app Annie, a provider of mobile market data and analytics for app stores, are taking part in order to reach out to Korean developers.
If you compare it to five years ago, you have a PC game, you have an online game. Uh, you need to, you want to launch in China, you need to look for partners there, look for service there, look for payment solution there. You want to launch in US, you need to find another partner. But now these days, if you want to launch an app business, you just need to upload your app to uh, I, Apple iTunes Store or uh, Google Play, and then instantly you are selling worldwide. A study released by the Korea Creative Content Agency estimated the country's gaming industry to be worth around 8.7 billion U.S. dollars as of 2013. Also, Korea's mobile gaming content industry almost tripled in 2013 from the previous year to more than 2 billion U.S. dollars. Kim Jong, Arirang News, Busan. U.S. President Barack Obama has ordered sweeping changes to the U.S. immigration system, setting the stage for a showdown with Republican leaders. With more, we turn to Paul Lee at the News Center. Paul, this executive order has the potential to change the lives of millions of undocumented workers living in the U.S. What's his plan of action? Well, in a national address Thursday, Obama said the measures would protect illegal migrants and their families from deportation under certain conditions. He said the executive action was common sense and criticized Congress for failing to address what he called a broken system. If realized, it will be the biggest step towards U.S. immigration reform in a generation. Our E. Jian has more. Over 11 million undocumented immigrants live in the United States. Now, nearly half of them might just be able to come out of the shadows. On Thursday, U.S. President Barack Obama announced an executive order hoping to fix the country's broken immigration system once and for all. If you've been in America for more than five years, if you have children who are American citizens or legal residents, if you register, pass a criminal background check, and you're willing to pay your fair share of taxes, you'll be able to apply to stay in this country temporarily without fear of deportation. The executive action covers up to 5 million people, but will not grant citizenship or give immigrants the right to stay in the country permanently. As for mass deportation, Obama said it would both be impossible and contrary to America's values. Although his executive order has the force of law, the Republican-dominated Congress is getting ready to fight the president tooth and nail. Congressional Republicans are considering all options, ranging from defunding the plan to even a government shutdown. President Obama preemptively responded to the arguments in his address. The actions I'm taking are not only lawful, they're the kinds of actions taken by every single Republican president and every single Democratic president for the past half century. Amid all the immigration talk, a new survey found that the number of illegal South Korean immigrants in the U.S. stood at around 180,000 as of 2012. This puts South Korea as the eighth largest group of illegal immigrants in the U.S. Lee Jun, Arirang News. And turning to the U.K., Prime Minister David Cameron's Conservative Party has been dealt a heavy blow following its defeat in the country's by-elections. Who came out on top? That would be the UK Independence Party. They're seeking an immediate exit from the European Union as well as stricter immigration controls. UKIP candidate Mark Reckless emerged as the big winner in what experts say could prove a key moment in British politics. The right wing party won its second seat in Parliament on Friday after capturing the southeastern constituency of Rochester and Shrewd. UKIP leaders said the result was not merely a protest against the government, but a sign of bigger things to come. This is your victory. As you say it, think of this. Rochdren Strood was our 271st most winnable seat. If we can win here, we can win across the country. If you vote UK, you get UK. Voter turnout came to nearly 51 percent, accounting for over 40,000 ballots. Amid growing public support, the anti-EU movement is raising concerns among businesses, investors and European partners that the country may fall further away from the 20-nation bloc. Mm. And staying in Europe, U.S. Vice President Joe Biden arrived in Ukraine as part of efforts to defuse the crisis in the east of the country. Paul, this visit comes as tensions have yet again reignited between government forces and pro-Russian separatists. 
Right, and Biden will be holding talks with Kiev's leaders on that very conflict, which has been drawn out over this past year. This as the Ukrainian government says it hopes Washington will offer some support in order to break the deadlock. The visit also comes as the country marks the first anniversary since the start of the revolution that toppled the former president, Viktor Yanukovych. Our Kim Hyun-bin reports. U.S. Vice President Joe Biden arrived in Kiev on Thursday to discuss new non-lethal aid to Ukraine, including deliveries of the first Humvee vehicles as an expansion of support to fight pro-Russian separatists in the country's east. Russia warned the U.S. hours before Biden's arrival against the move. We have heard repeated confirmations from the U.S. administration that only non-lethal weapons are being delivered to Ukraine. If there is a change in such policy, then we can speak of a serious destabilizing factor that seriously impacts the balance of forces in this region. Russia cautioned against a major change in policy from the U.S. in regard to the conflict in Ukraine. That will be a direct violation of agreements reached. The Geneva Statement from April 17, where apart from the major task for starting national dialogue in Ukraine, the task of stopping all fighting in this territory was repeated again. The U.S. backs Kiev in a struggle against pro-Russian rebels in two eastern regions and imposed sanctions on Moscow as a result of its alleged support. Russia denies providing the rebels with arms and troops. Washington says it will continue to assess how best to support Ukraine and that nothing is off the table, including lethal aid. The United Nations says more than 4,300 people have died since the conflict sparked in mid-April. It adds that nearly 1,000 people, or an average of 13 people per day, have been killed in fighting since the ceasefire was called on September 5th. Human Bin, Arirang News. And finally, returning to the U.S., it's that time of the year again when major retail, retailers and shoppers embrace the winter holiday spirit. Paul, Black Friday is just one week away, but it looks like stores there are already putting up the Christmas lights. Yeah, it always seems to creep up a little earlier every year. And as you said, retailers, especially large department stores, have begun rolling out their annual decorations ahead of the massive wave of holiday shoppers. In New York City, Macy's flagship store unveiled their famous Christmas displays on Thursday night. The spectacular show of lights and toys has become an iconic attraction, bringing in huge crowds each year. On the economic side, U.S. retailers are hoping to keep the strong momentum of sales figures from last month right up to Christmas Eve. Other data on this Friday showed consumer sentiment had reached a seven-year high in November. It's a positive sign that the U.S. economy will continue on the recovery track as households are expected to spend over $600 billion this holiday season. Sunny? Well, just another reminder to get a head start on that holiday shopping. All right, Paul, thanks for those updates. We'll see you back in just about two hours. TGIF everyone, I'm Kim Bo Kyung with your weather forecast. So it was a foggy but mild autumn day here in Seoul while heavy clouds hovered down south. And at the moment, it is raining in some regions, including Seoul. So it looks like less than 5 millimeters of precipitation will fall in parts of the central regions through tomorrow afternoon. Other than that, a heads up for those of you making plans for outdoor activities as finest levels may be on the rise tomorrow. Besides that, as for the weekend, uh, besides the big gap in temperatures between the day and night, mild autumn conditions are in store. On to Saturday's readings, Seoul reaches 14, Daegu hits 18, Gwangju 17, Busan 19. On to other regions, Daejeon hits 15, Jeju peaks at 19, Dokdo reaches 15, Mount Kumgang remains cooler. Hope you have a wonderful Friday evening. Here's a look at the international weather.
That will do it for this edition of Arirang News. Thanks for watching.